Welcome to Open Your Reality, ladies and gentlemen. We have a very special guest on today. His name is Howdy Mikowski, and he is going to be talking about a subject that some of you are going to love, some of you may not vibe with, but it's going to be very interesting. Welcome to the show, Howdy. <laughs> oh, thanks, Chad. Thanks for having me on. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Like yeah, I was saying yeah. earlier, you've got a lot of really good stuff on your channel. So it's going to be interesting to see how we go through this material. Absolutely. I, I th there's, a, you, there's a lot that you have to say. So this might be the first of a couple of interviews. <laughs> uh, someone turned me on to you. Uh, one, one of my viewers said, you got to get Howdy Mikowski on your channel. And I checked out your material. Uh, I fell in love with it, even though I watched just several videos. I like that you're very clear in what you say. And it, it's, it's not obfuscated with a lot of jargon. Um, you sent me your book. Then what's, I'm sorry, please tell our, our uh, audience the name of your book, please. Uh, the new book is called Exit the Cave, Ending the Reincarnation Trap, and it's the first book of a two-book series. Hopefully, I'll get a second one done next year to go deeper into it. Is this the first book that you've written, or have you written before? No, my first, well, I've written a few long ago, but the first on sort of these subjects, that would be The Power of Then, from about 2005 on Ancient Egypt and um, Alchemy and the Maya. Then it was uh, falling for truth, which was surrounding my near-death experience in 2005. Uh, then I wrote exposing the expositions on the uh, World's Fairs in um, the 1800s. Okay, and so when when was that World Fair book published? So that was 2019. So literally a month before all the insanity started. Okay, all right. So it's been three years. And you've put out this latest book. When, I'm, when did you release this latest book? Was it just like um, early this year? Well, yeah, like September. I, September, I, September. I got yeah, I got the feeling that I'd wanted to now write a book on Plato's cave. That was where it originally started back in like May or uh, March or April. And slowly, as I began that research, I started going back to things I'd studied twenty years ago, which was this idea of what is our reality really, and are we. Are we here for, a, is this thing set up in a place to help us or is this thing set up in a way to trap us? And that's where the, the research began um, to go through, yeah. Yeah, and can you just give us, um, now we're going to get into this because you have some very, very interesting ideas about reality, about how this could be a soul trap, you know, a la David Icke's uh, new book, which is called The Trap, which I think he put out in the same month you did, September. Uh, I, I wanted to, to ask you what before we get into that. What is your background? Are you, you you sound like you have an American accent, but you live in Europe. I'm Canadian, uh, originally by birth. Moved to Norway like nine years ago, so I've been over in Scandinavia for a while. Uh, I was uh, basically a hockey player for a lot of my life. Then became a stand-up comedian. <laughs> went through a ton of. I will call them difficult. I don't want to necessarily say trauma. They were trauma. They were trauma and experience that people have gone through way worse than me. But it was through those traumas that opened the doorways to eventually writing my book on ancient Egypt, meeting the medicine men that I had time to train with in Canada with a Korean um, monk with uh, several uh, Qigong doctors from China. And, and that, was my, that was my beginning 20 years ago into studying reality. Yeah, I was going to say, how does a hockey player who's who's dabbling with with comedy all of a sudden go into such serious subjects? And you said it was a trauma. Do you do you want to expound a little bit on that, or is it something that you don't talk about on your channel? It's no, it's it's fine. Yeah, I was in the midst of a massive depression. I had had a, my my father had stolen all my money from me right at the end of university, so I had this massive change in trust. You might say, you know, for. Because it was, it was almost impossible. I did finish my university degree. I got a history degree. But it was very difficult to finish it. Then just as I finished university, um, the my ex-girlfriend was murdered. And so once, you, once that kind of hit me and I realized reality doesn't work the way you're supposed to, or reality doesn't, doesn't do the way it's supposed to do. You have this, this structure of go to school, do this, get a job, get married, go have kids, do any you know, of this. And she was following the script perfectly and she was dead. 
So obviously there was something wrong with the script. And it kind of, along with everything else that was going on, it spun me into a pretty deep depressive place for about two years. And near the end of it, I, I just didn't like how I was becoming. I was becoming quite mean to people. I was being manipulative. And I just, I didn't like what I saw in the mirror. And I actually got to the point where I thought I, I wanted to kill myself because I just, I hated what I was seeing so much, but I couldn't think of a, I couldn't think of a nice way to do it that wouldn't be messy for the person who would find me. And in sort of the midst of that on like, I think the day after my birthday, that's when the, the, uh, uh, video on uh, Egyptian pyramid building came on TV, just found it by accident. I saw that video and I said, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what my life is supposed to be. And it's like the depression ended, the low energy ended. And it was like immediately, uh, I was charged with a purpose and uh, I spent, yeah, 10 years studying ancient Egypt, the Maya, the Inca. That's what I did for a large portion of time 10 years ago, as well as then testing reality. That's how it started for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, uh, I'm sorry you went through that. I, I've thought about <laughs> not very seriously about taking my own life and like, how would I do it? And it's, I just can't bring myself to do it. You know, there's no easy, <laughs> seems like there's no. no easy way. Um, but no, I'm not, I'm not, no. uh, I'm not thinking along those lines, but, uh, maybe after reading your book, I will though, because it was pretty yeah. depressing. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just a little comedy there. No, that's a good point because a lot of people, when they read the book or when they hear my interviews might, might say, you know, you're, you're, you're sounding really negative. The stuff you're saying is negative and actually I think I'm very positive because the end result of the, the work and the, and the study is the finding of your true power, the finding of what we really are, the finding of the deepest um, intensity that we shine with. The problem is we're covered with so much garbage, so many lies, so many walls, so many hidden things, and that's those are hard to break through. The, the lies and deceptions are so well built that you can't get through them kind of nicely you have to push a bit on those so it that's what it sounds negative but the end result of it if you get through to the end of what we what i talk about or what the book is about it's actually quite a positive ending it's just yeah a lot of people don't like the trip yeah I, you know the, the, a lot of my audience i originally based m most of my channel off of tom campbell's mbt theory dr newton's journey of souls destiny of souls that kind of idea or those mm -hmm. kind of ideas H have you do you have experience with those ideas if you know who tom campbell is and dr michael newton have yeah. you looked into that yeah like tom campbell really surprises me because you know chapter three in my book i go through various um we we'll call it, i don't want to call them creation myths but ideas of creation um, and I'll get to that in a second, but one of them is Robert Monroe's. Robert Monroe, I talk about his his uh, his chapter 12 of Far Journeys, where he talks about Louche and the entire farming of everything, not just humans, but the farming of everything in this world. And what I find so strange was that Robert Monroe, once he had written that book in, in 1971, I think he said he went through a three-month depression, and he, he didn't come out of his house. He like literally locked himself away, and then he came out, you know, he had the he began the Monroe Institute. It, it's like this massive out of body research center. Yeah. He's never talked about this again. The research center has never talked about Louche again. And Tom Campbell, who's very connected to this whole thing, and he wrote all those big toe books, he never talks about it either. So it's not even like which I find really really strange. It's not even like they come out and say, yeah, this is a big subject in Robert Monroe's book, and we don't talk about it now. We don't look. We don't focus on it because and give an answer. They just. They refuse to speak about it. And to me, it's like one of the most important reveals almost in human history. So that right away concerns me. Why don't they want to talk about it anymore? Have you looked into the West Penra papers? Yeah, I looked into those too. And uh, again, I have concerns with some of the presentation and some of the... It, it's so, you know, this material is so difficult. I, I mean, I have to come right up to me. I don't know what's going to happen after we die for sure. I don't know for sure how to exit the matrix. I'm working on, at least for myself, that's really what the book is for. The book is like a manual for me and all those that helps beyond me, that's like an extra added bonus. I'm so happy people like it and getting, getting value out of it. But it's, so I don't know that. I don't know for sure who or what created this reality, but after 25 years of this now and my own experiences and the people I've, I've you might say had as teachers on the way 
the th it's a thesis that I'm presenting. It's a piece of puzzle. And I look to others for, do they have other pieces that can fit? Uh, Wes, I had some concerns with just because um, I, I thought there were, there were too many things that were, uh, how's the way to say this? They were just, they were just, they felt a bit unverifiable. Like there was no way to really test what he was saying. It's like you either had to had to agree with it or not, but there wasn't like this extra. And here's how you can check it for yourself. So that's why I kind of, I'm kind of fifty fifty there with him. Yeah, and I I didn't get to read your full book. You sent it to me. Thank you. I read um, the first chapter, the introduction. And I did get, a, I mean, I got a lot of information. I, I, I wrote out like all these notes here. I don't know if people can see them, but oh. these are all quotes from your book and I have questions. So one of the things that you say in the book, and then I think it's chapter one, he said, this, this book is going to be radical to the extreme and heretical to its core. Nothing is sacred or off limits for examination because if ever, because if everything we have been told is a lie, then we have no foundation. And I, some people are watching this interview right now. They're, they're still wondering, what, what do you believe? Um, you, yeah. you first believe, right, going back to, your, to the early times of your spiritual journey, yeah. you did believe that God is good and that we are here for reincarnation. Karma is a real thing. And we come back and live the same life over and over to try to learn and maybe eventually we can escape it like the Buddhists say, but where do we go? This just leads down a whole rabbit hole here, but I just want to open up the floor to you and just respond to what I've just mm -hmm. said. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the standard story. I think we all, we all grow up with that foundation one way or another. It doesn't matter whether we come through a religion or not, is that this world is created by some sort of loving creator. This creator cares about us and has created a place where we learn and we grow and we gain experiences. And in fact, we have potential endless experiences that we can control and not control. And our, our goal is to, in some way, perfect ourselves so that we can rejoin this heavenly source. That's kind of the simple presentation. As I started to go through my life, of course, my life was pretty difficult. I had di I, I, a lot of people I was close to had very difficult lives. So there was a lot of questioning in, into that segment. I never really believed, even through all of my work with the, with the Native Medicine Men um, and Mr. Park from Korea, I never really believed in reincarnation for a long part of my life. I didn't disbelieve it either, but I had too many people who would say, you know, I was Cleopatra, I was Napoleon, I was, and you just kind of you know, but it's only been in the last like seven or eight years when you start to when I started to look into the experiences of young children specifically, mm -hmm. and the the verifiable information that they're giving about a life that they just have, should have no knowledge about, right? I, I, I'm sure you've heard that, that I've told this a couple of times, but it's an amazing story of a, of a kid four or five years old somewhere in texas who didn't like what is the name his parents was using and said no this is my name this is where i live this is my wife what are you doing to me and they finally they they checked in that city they found there was a woman by that name and they said you know we're going to shut our kid up so they took him in the car and this will this will end it he went to sat down with the chair and first thing where's my guitar where's my guitar well, it's just in the, in the bedroom. Obviously, I don't use it. Well, get to my guitar out. And the kid starts playing the guitar. And like, how does a kid know how to play the guitar? Then, well, where's my book? Where's this book? Where's this book? Well, I gave that away. I gave, well, do you still have this one? Yeah, is it still my notes on the pages? I made a lot of notes in that book. Yeah, yeah, here's the book. Yeah, 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 I still got the notes. And they, the parents were just, they, they didn't know what to believe. And in fact, they came to the conclusion, this is obviously the dead husband of this wife. There's no way they can know each other. So I got to that point. To finally answer your question, I started over time more and more beginning to start thinking like the Gnostic, uh, the Gnostics did, or the Cathars did, or even the ancient Egyptians or many others that actually this is not a loving creator who created this realm, that there is a, 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 a true force or an absolute force out there, but there was, depending on the mythology, was a break from that and a new being came about known as the, the Demiurge to Gnostics, Rex Mundi to the Cathars. They are the creator of this realm and this realm is actually a, a simulated copy of truth uh, designed to uh, trick 
we can call them divine sparks, not really souls. We trick divine sparks, which is us, to come in here. And then once we're in, we become like a giant battery, a giant power source to make this run. And I know it sounds like a bit like the Matrix, but that's that's one of the truths that's in that movie. That Because it makes sense. If Let's pretend this is a giant uh, computer realm. If this is like a giant computer, the amount of energy that's needed to run it, because we're not just talking this part of Plato's cave, the material realm. We're talking the etheric, the astral, the super astral, the angel, whatever. That's a huge amount of energy that's required. It would make sense. It would be smart if you could use the beings in your computer game to be the ones that generated the power to keep the game running. And I think that's what we've got going here. There's, in a sense, uh, we're called food for the system or whatever. But it's really we're just we're the we're we're here to be energy to actually keep the system running. And the rest of the system is designed to kind of trick us to not make us see that. Yeah, I know you do say in your book that you're ninety nine. 0.9% sure that reincarnation exists. I definitely believe it exists. Uh, I've seen a lot of proof for it. Uh, based on what you just said, I can go down um, several different trails, but it just makes me think, you said that humans are like batteries, very similar to the Matrix movie. If that's so, what does it say about our world that the population has been increasing so drastically in the last 120 years. In 1900, the population was about 2 billion. Now we're coming up on, what is it? Is it 7, 8 billion? Eight, nine, nine, almost. 9 maybe. billion, right? Just going to keep going up. Who knows? Does but that mean knows? it's more power for the system? Are they entrapping more? Is the demiurge entrapping more souls in it? Is it more no, powerful? No, I think... No, I think I think it's the opposite. I think what's been I think the same number of souls. This is just my personal opinion. I don't think the number of souls here have changed at all over the last few thousand years. What we're seeing is more and more what you would call non-player characters. You're seeing more and more robots being created to make uh, make uh, bigger populations, bigger, uh, in a sense, to create, to have more conflicts, to have more problems, to have more difficulties. The more people you have, the larger things get, the more complex it gets. Combination of not only do you then the people at the top actually have an easier time with the control structures, you also have more, more, more possibilities of, of, problems and fear. Because if you grow up in a small, small town or village with a hundred people, you know everybody. And and it, within by the time you're ten years old, you got the town figured out. You know what's going on. But you live in New York City, where you got twenty million. There's always somebody around some other corner that's you know to be scared of, to be frightened of, to be you know. So I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing more and more what I would call non-player characters. What I think is interesting because now we are coming to the Great Reset, and they're, they're not using these words by accident. This is very clear why they're choosing these words. Th this realm is getting reset. Uh, people like to think of it, it. It's a it's a government reset. It's a monetary reset. It's a when you think of it, it's energetic. It's an and it's happened before. They, this has happened other times in our past. So this is going to be reset energetically because I think for some reason the system the the system is getting bigger. The the the, the computer game is getting bigger. The the, the simulations in, increasing. There's the same amount of power coming in. They need to increase the power. But like you say, they don't have more souls to come in here. So how are they going to increase the power? They've got to change the structure. And I think that's what's really going on. I think if you see what's going to be coming, I know it is coming, in, in terms of energy, it'll start to make sense. It'll also explain how we as individual people who don't want to be a part of it, how we are able to start breaking away from it, because it's also about energy. It's also about the control of our energy and understanding how energy works in this system. So when we see things energetically, I think we get a, we, we have an, we, we get a doorway to an opportunity to understand what we should be doing. You know, you're sounding very much like Jason Brashears of the Archaics channel. Are you familiar with him? Yeah, I am. Although uh, we, it, it's hard to say how much we have. We have some similarities and other things that are not. So, um, yeah. But yeah, I know Jason. So Jason believes that there is a real world, that this is a computer simulation, that we're going through a series of lives that happen relatively quickly, maybe just a few hours in the real world somewhere, and then we're back out into this real world. And this simulation is supposed to be, a, like Tom Campbell says, a virtual reality trainer for consciousness, but it was overridden by this artificial intelligence, which Jason calls AIX, artificial intelligence X, unknown. Um, 
Do you believe the same or in your theory, does it diverge from what I just said? Yeah, I mean, that that's certainly one theory is it, you've got the you got the challenge. OK, the world's insane. The world, the world's a, the world's a, a world's a clown show. Well, the question is, has it always been a clown show from the moment of its inception? Or was it something else at one point in time and then changed into the clown show? And I'm I'm on the I guess on the small side now that is beginning to say that it's always been it's always been insane just to various levels there's been different there's been times when it's been higher times when it's been lower um i know when i go to sites like when i'm in giza or dashu or abu sir or teotihuacan in mexico i i feel i'm touching a place that's so far back in the past that is um or it might not be in the past because this is interesting about simulation right a simulation starts on a on a day one so there's a day one that just like in westworld right the robots think it's 1861 but there hasn't been an 1860 there wasn't really an 1859 those are just memories that have been pl implanted in their mind so if but this if this is a simulation we have to ask well, how old is the simulation because if the simulation say is 200 years old, then everything we know of its history before 200 years is just Westworld backstory. It's not actually real in our simulation. It might be real whatever we're copied from. So it makes it so difficult even to start trying to track how this how this realm has been, how it wasn't been. And maybe that's the, the, the problem. We can see the part that's before the simulation that comes from the copy that might might have been a good place but maybe our simulation right from day one has never been good so bizarrely both of these theories might actually be correct just when you apply it to the start date of when the simulation began of, as like a marker of insane before and maybe not so insane uh, on the other side of it yeah there's a quote from your book here that kind of supports what you're saying which is we live in a physical and energetic slaughterhouse. You are living in many ways as a computer game character or semi-programmed robot in a very insane system. How many worms have just died in the last five seconds to feed all the birds? How many mice died to feed all the cats? Have you ever heard a worm scream while it is being eaten? What set up such an insane and sick system? I often wonder that too when you watch these nature shows and you see that other animals have to rely, they, they, they can only rely on eating other animals. And as much as you want to say, well, it's God's plan, it's nature, you know, the animal doesn't really feel that much pain, the one that's being eaten. I mean, still, that animal has got to be in fear, it's got to be in pain, it's got to be suffering. What kind of system, David Icke said this in, in one of his books a long time ago, what kind of system would set up something where we have to rely on eating other beings to exist? Your comments. Yeah, yeah that, uh, to me, that, that indicates the insanity. There's so many other ways that it could be set up, but it's been set up in this way. And I mean, we have this problem. People, we can see nature in, it, in its beauty. Nature has a beauty side of it, right? And we, we tend to like to only try to see that side of it. Like I said, we forget we forget the slaughter side of it. We forget that yeah. part of it. Now, this I say, this answer takes us a bit more into the Robert Monroe material because Robert Monroe had talked about that there were these different that the beings uh, he didn't call them archons like the Gnostics did. I can't remember what he had, if he had a name for the beings that run this thing, but whatever he called them, they uh, the, the the people from somewhere I can't remember what the name what the exact name was, but he said there were different segments that they ran in this realm, and it seemed like he first described dinosaurs, then he described uh, plants, then he described animals, and he and he talked about each time there was like an upgrade to the energy system. But when they got to the first round of animals, he said that. By accident, they found out that when the animals were in conflict, and particularly when an animal was dying to another animal, that was the greatest louche harvest that these beings got. So they realized we have to shut that system down and make a brand new one that'll create as much conflict and as much suffering as possible, because you might say that was giving them this idea, this thing, word called louche is like a specialized energy that beings give off, particularly when we're afraid or, or when we're suffering or when we're in some kind of pain. So they created our, our what our world is, and according to them, we were brought in here, according to Robert Monroe, we were brought in here as specialized uh, conflict, conflict action individuals to create as much of this loose as possible. That's his that's his theory, and that would explain where where you're at with the nature thing. I had a secondary vision at the end of that chapter, which was the complete opposite, which my vision from 2009 indicated that it was nature that actually created us, that we weren't actually created by 
the creator beings at all. And we had nothing to do with aliens or anything else that literally nature created us uh, uh, to help it. Uh, nature realized it was trapped here. It couldn't get out. It created humans because we don't fit in here. We don't, we don't belong on, on earth. We just don't fit in here properly. It, it almost made sense that nature made us to help, uh, help all of us get out. And I kind of hold a little bit of that. I like that feeling where even if I am going to find the exit to the matrix and I'm on my way out, I want to take some trees and some rocks and some giraffes and some fish with me because I feel like maybe that's part of our job. And when you say humans don't fit in here, it's kind of like, yeah. where do we come from? You know, the, they talk about the missing link. And also we, we're just so different, right? Like we're so different as human beings, black, white, Asians, and geography can't account for that. Right. Like that just because, a group of people um, evolved in one region or another just because the climate doesn't really make sense to me. Also, what about our eating habits as a species? We have we don't we don't agree at all on what we're supposed to eat. It seems like the animals know what they're supposed to eat, but we as humans don't. Are are we supposed to be vegan? Or are we supposed to be carnivore, omnivore? Um, this is a debate that's been raging on for for eons, and. <laughs> Uh, what, maybe that's the case because we're just what how do we you say nature put us here can you explain yeah well we can think of all these things like we're the only creature that needs to make fires to stay warm we have to have clothing we have to have we have to have uh, shelters we, yeah we we don't know what to eat naturally we're not really sure what our diet's supposed to be um you know we're the only ones like like think about if we get hay fever you're allergic to grass what sort of possible evolutionary power is it to be allergic to the thing you're going to be out with all the time or color blindness or all these other goofy things that humans have that just don't make sense so once you begin to break it down, we're the only being that doesn't like walk out of here with complete total instinct, knowing exactly what it's supposed to do and why and how and not have to think about it. We literally have to think about everything. So, yeah, I had a vision that seems, like I say, to indicate that, and I'm not saying it's true. It's just a vision I had after a, after a Native Indian um, drumming ceremony with a medicine man friend of mine. And it just came up as this idea that, <clears throat> it was that this realm was built with with no humans it, it was a realm of nature uh, animals and and whatnot and they it was nature that realized they were trapped here it, it's nature that's trapped and so we were built from the nature they gave it that we hear we hear things like i i have a power animal well our power animal is really the animal spirit that gifted us a spark of animal life to come in here that's what our power animal is we have a plant we have a plant uh we have a power plant, we have a power stone, we have a power everything. The problem was, is once we started to infuse ourselves, and, and that's why nature allows us to use it. In the, in the, in the um, vision, it said, so humans don't belong here, so you need, you need to chop down our trees to, to, to stay warm. You need to kill some of our animals to eat here. So we're going to allow that, but you have a job to do. Your job is open this door that we can't open. The problem is these archons, or what you call these beings that are uh, attempting to control this place saw that right away humans are a big problem and they actually started manifesting from outside the realm in the astral directly into this realm in order to make things difficult and create the conflict and the problems and the constant humans attacking each other warfare everything else was all designed to get us to forget why we were here and what we're doing a perfect example of this is the movie dark city dark city which is a fantastic movie it's actually the original matrix it's like the first it's really it's actually matrix one is if you understand how the things are running and in dark city we never find out where the humans came from we never found out why they got there we never found out how the city was built as base all of that stuff just like this plato's cave story is ignored it's just it's just not there and that's very similar to where we, we really have no idea Truly, where we're from, where we're not from, and I think what we're calling, I guess that's anthropology, I think all of that anthropology of our origins is just one giant smokescreen to hopefully give us enough information that we won't ask enough questions, because if we start asking real questions, we're going to find out none of the answers we're given make any sense. Yeah, it does seem that much of the information that we're given about our, our history our diet, who we really are, everything is backwards. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I was just having a conversation with my mother and I was telling her that most of my diet is composed of saturated fat now from animals. And she said, well, that's terrible. And I said, no, mom, because what they told you uh, was backwards. They told you don't eat any fat, you know, eat sugar <laughs> and carbs. Right. <laughs> but it's, it's really the other way. So there's a lot of conditioning because the system can condition you. And you said in, yeah. and I have the quote, but you said somewhere that this, this is a good one. You talked about Gilligan's Island. You said that there were people that actually wrote letters to what the U S Navy back in the sixties yeah. or seventies when Gilligan's Island, which was a, a famous TV show in America where there were seven stranded castaways on an Island and people couldn't differentiate uh, a TV sitcom and reality. And so if, if and, and it wasn't like a spoof, people really thought that they no, were the, the, the U.S. Coast Guard. Yeah, they got like thousands of letters asking them why they weren't going to rescue these people off this island. You know, the and, first couple of ones they thought was a joke, but they realized people really, but they, they realized that the people thought the TV show was real. Or how many times, especially in the 1970s, did soap opera stars get attacked on the street, you know, they because of the way you treated Constance last week. And, I, you know, they people just, the, the line is blurred between reality and not, if they can't even tell the difference between a television show and reality, how conditioned and, and ignorant are the majority of the population? That gets us back to, are they even... Are they non-player characters? Do, do, are, they, are they literally, how, may, how many of our population are really human and how many aren't? Yeah, that, that, I have a couple of questions here. So what, let me put a comment in. So you can imagine sure. a lot of people sitting home, they're watching their TV screens, they have CNN on, and they hear Don Lemon talking. So if they believe Gilligan's Island is real, yep. then everything that CNN says is real as well, you know, in their minds. Yep. And you're right. They could be NPC. Okay. And I want to. I want to just ask yeah. you a quick question. Obviously, what, what, just just to get you on that. Here's a book everybody should read. It's called "The Four Arguments for the for the Elimination of Television." The guy who wrote it was named Jerry Mander. This book came out in 1977, so like 40 years ago. He explained how the how a screen actually causes changes in the body, changes in the brain, makes you uh, makes you easy to control, easy to manipulate, easy to uh, fall for authority. It's like, it's like our world right now is described 40 years ago. And bizarrely, the thing we're all staring at right now is part of the entire process. So when you're talking about like watching the news, the news is has have for 50 or 60 years figured out the exact mechanism, the exact the exact presentation they need to get into the subconscious. And what, it's always interesting. This is an interesting thing to think about. If they put out a story first and they say whatever they want to say and the story comes out and the pictures are there and people are shocked, but then the next day, oh, you know, we were, we were mistaken. That was an error. We're, we're sorry about that. The story was wrong people will still remember the first day. That's what got into the subconscious first. So it doesn't matter what they tell the story is later. It's what was the first story that comes in, and they know that. So, I mean, it, we're dealing with that on a daily basis. And if you don't know this stuff, just like it's, it, it, the manipulation is so easy to get, and once it's in, it's hard to get out. Hmm. What percentage of Earth's population do you think are NPC? I know it's a difficult question, but if you just have uh, an idea in mind, just share with our audience. My guess, uh, what you, it used to be maybe 20 or 25 percent when I was uh, doing all my practices and my exercises. I'm shooting now maybe 85, 90 percent, like that high. Wow. And okay. one, uh, one of the things that helped me indicate who might be and who might not be was, and this was, again, I, I did so much, so much of so many exercises back from what the shamans gave me. I read Carlos Castaneda's book and books and I did them. Like I actually, everything that was in the books I did. Um, and back then I was, I would test people. And what I found really strange was is certain people would have all sorts of possible answers, all sorts of possible discussion points, and they could go, but other people, they had a really tight box. It didn't matter what the subject was we were talking about. The answers tended to be almost exactly the same. Like there was like a limited set of answers, a limited set of things they could say. And I began to, I would test these people. 
and I would go on to like subject matters you would never talk about. Oh, let's talk about ski jumping or something. You know, no one's going to talk about ski jump. Let's talk. Their answers would be the same as if you're talking about construction on the street. It was really weird. And that's when I started to realize there are these people. I don't know if they're people or not, but at least they're living in a really tight box of possibility and answers and they can't for any reason go outside of this and not just thought it's literally what they say it's it's it was weird yeah and i think yeah well let me just say this my audience is not npc okay they're free thinkers they're real people and it's a small audience so thank you youtube for eliminating all the npcs shadow banning me and giving me just a nice core group no matter how many videos or, I or, or the npc the npcs might come later and try to comment but they probably don't watch early on right like the you know that we know the bots and things are moving on these things all the time but uh, i noticed for sure like in if i put a video out and certainly in the first say day the ones who watch in that first day are guaranteed their people working through stuff and and i'm really thankful like probably you are the people some of the people in your channel and and the people the comments i get have been so helpful to me they, they've opened doors that i never would have known about they've made suggestions i never would have made a suggestion about but when you start watching maybe day three day four things are different and so yeah there there there's a core group though that uh i would yeah i would 99.9 <laughs> .9 check marked no, absolutely. I agree with you on that. Uh, my, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be anywhere where I am right now without the viewers. From the beginning, they were recommending, suggesting, uh, yep. giving me feedback. So I've taken it all to heart to create the channel to what it is right now. I mean, it, you're a direct result. This interview is a direct result of some viewers saying, hey, get Howdy on your show. So thank you to the viewers. And... You know how do you, like I just want to simplify things right now just really simplify it down to kindergarten level. Okay. Okay, just in case somebody's watching they're a little confused or maybe they're doing something else and they didn't cap catch everything you said. But you used to believe if if I'm if I'm not mistaken, you used to believe very similar to many spiritual people that the world is a school and we come here to learn. Yeah. Right? And we reincarnate into the school god is right. a benevolent god put us here for a reason and when did the when did that shift occur where you started to believe that we are living in a soul trap was that like in 2019 well i mean i bumped into this stuff long ago 2002 2003 i'd already began studying um right after the um 9 11 event that opened a lot of doors for me to how this reality was really run and who and what was running it and why and I took about four or five years to, to study that material. Then I had my death experience and I was I was dropped into the void. Like I was literally dropped into oneness. And that that took my attention for like 10 years. It, it seemed like as that's what the books all said is the this is the pinnacle. If you reach the oneness, if you reach the the if you reach the totality, the absolute, you're done. And so I, I actually falsely believed that. And I lived that for 10 years. But eventually a lot of difficulties over those 10 years as well as a lot of clarity led me to start going back to where i used to be where i what things i had seen a long time ago and kind of turned off and for me i began to finally realize this can't be a school when you start digging into the near-death experiences of people and particularly those who have pre-birth memories and they're all very clear that they got a memory wipe that in this pre-birth uh, field, they remembered their past life very clearly, even though they can't remember it now, they knew that they remembered it. And then these beings, whoever they were interacting with, made them forget and put, a, put them back in here. And to me, this idea that if, you, if we're being memory wiped and you can't remember your past lives, this can't be a place of learning because learning comes from a big part of it is seeing what we did yesterday, seeing what worked and what didn't work, mistakes we made, things we did well, so we know how we want to respond today. Uh, you know, if, if when we go into grade five, we don't forget everything we learned in grade one and four and have to learn to add and subtract again. We know that we can move into multiplication and division. We can so that to me right away was the indication there's a problem, and that leads us to the TV show Westworld. <clears throat> Westworld because Westworld is all about the memory wipe. Or season one was. 
you know, the, the robots would die. They would get taken back to the control center. They get cleaned up. They get fixed up. And then they get memory wiped. So they can be put back uh, into Westworld so they can be raped and killed and destroyed again. And I realized that this couldn't work. If we started remembering our past lives and remembering what was in there in, in our in our totality, we would start because Westworld's a story of Dolores and Maeve. And it's the story of them remembering what's happened to them in incarnation after incarnation and deciding, I don't know, it's outside of Westworld, but I'm done with this place and I'm getting the hell out of here. And that's kind of where I've gotten to now, where I've realized um, I'm realized uh, I'm done with the insanity and it's time to go home. And um, I'm hoping that that what I'm doing in my journey is helpful to others who also might want to go home. I have a quote from your book. It says, no matter how much you moved along in the last life, you are back at square one in the new life, ignorant of everything once again. All the exalted knowledge we have come to believe in either books or from people we came to admire only has value in the moment. And I realize that as well. We do get a memory wipe. Tom Campbell says it's because if we remembered the spirit world and our past lives, it would just create too much confusion. We would know this world is not real, and then we wouldn't have as much skin in the game, so to speak. And that's the reason for the memory wipe. I know you, are you shaking your head. Go ahead. Please respond. Yeah, no, no. That's to me, that's obvious that's an obvious example of I don't want to I don't want to deal with the truth. I want to. I want to find an answer that makes me feel good because if you, it, it's obvious that's not what it's for. And and there's been so many people who. I mean, we, we're talking about. Okay, so you've got the near death experience, the standard one, the white light, the dead grandma, Jesus, the life review. That's eighty five percent. That's it, and it's a stand. We can talk about that. It's a standard story, the near death experience. But then you've got the fifteen percent that are very different that seem to go further than that. Most of them indicate in their experiences it's a pretty it's a pretty sick realm out there that the astral realm is pretty dangerous and that the and that dead grandma and Jesus aren't really dead grandma and Jesus it are these it are these um, uh, alien type beings who are scanning your mind figuring out what's the best form to use in order to trick and deceive you and send you back here so my concern is is that. Anyone who's trying to explain away a realm where it's constant suffering. I mean, think of some of, I mean, there's a lot of people out there right now. Your life is probably okay. It's not so bad. Think of what it's like right now, kid in Ukraine. Think of what a starving kid in Ethiopia is going through. Think of what uh, someone who's in a Turkish prison is going through. Suffering. And probably they don't deserve it. And if you're going through suffering right now and, you, and you've had a real shitty traumatic life, you don't deserve that. Really. You do not. There's nothing when you were born as a small child that indicated you need to suffer. And, and one of my, I'll stop here and then you can comment. One of my favorite quotes is from Richard Rose on this subject. And he says, why would an omnipotent being create a bunch of ignorant people and then torture them to make them better? It doesn't make any sense. You know, and if we're all knowing, if we're supposed to be all knowing before we are I into this realm, why do we need to come in here and suffer in order to learn more? It, it, once you think about it, it makes no sense. Something else has to be going on. Okay, my thesis is one thesis. There could be others, others that are there, but it, it, it's obviously not for our benefit. You know, suffering is not for your benefit. No, I agree with you on that. It, if we are infinite beings, so to speak you know, part of the, what Tom calls the LCS, why this need to suffer. Tom says it's because the LCS, which is like God is imperfect. So its strategy is to break itself into, into billions of individual units. We call souls that need to incarnate into a virtual reality simulation in order to evolve and learn. My thing with MBT is always like Tom always says the LCS needs to evolve or entropy exists. And I'm always saying to myself, well, if it's in a void, because the LCS kind of is in a void, it's not in a, it's not a mechanical system. Why does it go through entropy? You know, and why would it need to fix that? So yeah. that's, that's a, that's a, a, a question that I've never really been able to, faithfully resolve with MBT. Um, do you have thoughts on that? I have, a, I have a perfect quote that also sums that up. This is from a woman, Angelica and Agonostu, and she says, 
Uh, in other words, souls started off as pure spiritual entities and are incarnated into matter. Why? To return home where they started from pure again, and having gained what? Virtual life experiences useless to the spiritual plane. It's a it's a perfect th a thing again to think about. Like, what do we, what what does a what does a soul what does a divine spark really truly gain from being here? This is the hard part we have to really ask. What what is really the gain that we get? Now I know we have we have a belief structure. All of us do of what we're why why it's positive for us to be in a material body. But the Cathars right. The Cathars were very clear. This is the first group uh, um, that the Catholic, the, or the, uh, the Church of Rome had a inquisition and crusade against. They crusaded against their own people in the 1200s, and they had a very specific belief. They believed the same thing. They believed that this was a realm of a reincarnation trap, and that their only purpose in life was to end the cycle. That's it. So the material world and what happened into it had like a 10% importance. 90% of all of their time was built into um, how to leave. And I found this, uh, I have a whole chapter on the Cathars because it's so interesting because why would a group of vegetarian pacifists uh, supposedly have access to the Holy Grail? Why are they so terrifying to the Church of Rome that they need to exterminate them? And I needed to dig into this story in much more deeper terms and start asking questions like, well, what might they what might they have known and is there anything that they have known that's valuable to us now do you think the illuminati the elite the cabal know that this is a soul trap and maybe that's why they worship satan and they uh they're against god could that be uh well again the, the as soon as you start throwing that term around uh god we're back to well what does that even mean Right. We know what people want to think it means, but even the word itself, what is it? What is it? What is it really pointing to? I know, like, even the, the hermeticists, they didn't like they didn't like to talk. They call it father, but they didn't even like to use that word. They, they kind of kept trying to keep it nameless. So it's almost like all the times you start directing it, you're still directing it to the demiurge. And the demiurge just has many different possible forms of which to pull in your your focus right do i think they know i think more than that they know i think they are they are either beings who sold their souls at a time in the future so once you like just like cypher in the matrix he was selling his soul in that scene yeah. and once you sell your soul and it's gone i think you can get it back but it's pretty difficult but if you if you if it's gone you are now part of the system you're part of this entire simulation therefore if the simulation ended tomorrow all of us who are who are divine sparks, we would leave because there's nothing holding us here anymore. The, the 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 control net would be gone. But everything that's not a divine spark, that's a part of the system, would just disappear. They would disintegrate with the system. So, in my in my feeling, I think they on some level know that, and everything that they're doing is designed to keep the simulation running and keep the entire trap moving. Keep the humans um, and and the other beings plugged into the system uh, because they know if if we unplugged the system would end and they would end so it's it, you know we see them as pure evil but when you also start to see it as they're actually just trying to survive the only way they know how knowing that if the system goes they go it starts to make sense what they're doing and bizarrely if we could fi ever find an answer that solved their issue as well as ours we might actually we could actually get a a win-win solution for everything not just the divine sparks but even all the evil garbage in here we could potentially find a a really good answer but that would take somebody with a far better brain than me to come up with that you say that we could possibly go home is there yeah. some type of real home like jason says jason Bashir's, that we go to uh what what is home for us my fe I guess it's a feeling because I don't know if I knew for sure I'd be there, right? But it's it's this feeling that I think we all all of us have this. We we get this. We have a nostalgia in our life for things in our past, mm -hmm. and we we kind of want to go back to them. But I don't think I think it's just symbolic for uh, the nostalgia we have for our true home, and our true home would be similar to the experience of the void. This is where I got caught in my own experience, and where um, I share this because. 
other other people in the spiritual world might be confused as well. We reach this void and we feel this this oneness, this not this place of no separation, no time, no 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 second, no. And the the problem is we feel like that's home. But if the if the whole simulation, the entire matrix, that's everything, is a copy, then the void is a copy of the true realm as well. So for me now, I'm starting to realize even when you hit the void, you're hitting like the farthest end of the matrix, but you're still in the matrix. You're still there. It's still not it's still not what we might call the the true absolute or the true oneness. There's still a deception. There's still a trick in there. And, and that's kind of what I've worked through the last few years that um, I had to get through a, um, a spiritual ego that got created from that, that was elevating myself to thinking, you know, oh, I, I know everything now because I've been in the void. And I had to start realizing, well, no, I maybe know more about the matrix, but home is not the matrix. Um, so I use, I use a simple explanation now of like, um, uh, it's like you've been at a party with a lot of your friends. You've been there all night. It, it was good for a while. A couple guys got in a fight and some stuff happened. Now it's three o'clock in the morning. Uh, the people that are still there, they're past, most of them passed out. They're puking on the floor and your friends are still trying to get you to have one more drink. Come on, have one more drink, have one more drink. And you're like, guys, this is no fun anymore. I just want to go home. I just want to go to bed. And that's kind of how I feel it is. So I, I don't necessarily have to know exactly what that's going to be like per se. I just know that it exists. And the whole point of what I'm sharing with this book and my conversations now is this realization that there's something inside of us. This divine spark is so powerful. It's so special. And in fact, it is more powerful than the entire simulation. It's more powerful than the archons. It's more powerful than the demiurge. Think about that. The, the Demiurge creator of this realm, you as a divine human spark, are greater than the Demiurge. The problem is we've been tricked into not seeing just how powerful we are. And if we learn how to stand in this authority and our own, our own true totality within, nothing can stop us ever. We, can, we, 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 will be, uh, we, we, we would be untrapped. And to me, it's it, it, there's, a, of course, a lot to do to do that, but it is also that simple. It's just regaining your own power. And that's what the, the point of this my whole book is, is just remembering, remembering the power we have, we have naturally. Yeah, and your, your book is well written, and it's easy to understand. And, and uh, I like the ideas that you put forward in it, and I look forward to reading it. As I was reading it, I was like, wow, this is one of the best books I've read in a long time. So if you are interested and you want to get Howdy's book, is it on Amazon? Where do they get the book? Yeah, there's two. There, it's been a. It was out uh, as a PDF file for a while because I wanted to get it out early. So you can still get it as a PDF file, ebook off my website, and it just came out as a print book like last week, actually. So now it's available. Yeah, Amazon, and it's starting to get to all the other, whether it's Barnes and Noble, whether it's at Libris, whether it's all these different sites. So you know, you don't have to buy it at Amazon. You can buy it anywhere. If it's not there yet, just wait a week. It'll show up. Um, okay. Yeah. And uh, by the way, so just. We're not ending the interview, but I just want to know, uh, just yeah. say it now, what is your YouTube channel name? Uh, Howdy McCoskey Talks. So that's what's there. Um, I'm on, I'm on uh, BitChute as well. Soon I'll be on Rumble and maybe a few other places. Uh, we all know the challenges we have on this platform. It, it's been valuable to reach people, but it's also we also have to be ready for where we're going to go next. And I'm also in that process of where do we go next to, to keep this going. Are you personally going to post on those other platforms or do you have somebody do it yeah. for you? You are? Okay. No, uh, it's all done by me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do you have to individually go to each platform or do you have a program that will upload it to all of them? Yeah, well, I don't know. I haven't been to some of the new ones yet. So, I mean, I've mostly just been here, bit shoot. I was on free voice for a while. And now that I'm looking to explore to other ones, I've got to actually learn the whole, learn how it runs. So I'm okay. still, you know, I'm still in novice land, but, I'll have yeah. to figure it out at some point. Yeah, I've just stayed here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've got a bunch of questions listed here. And, you know, I'm sure. seeing the time running down. But uh, this is it is a fascinating interview so far. I want to ask you, we talked about the near-death experience. There are many, many people who have talked about what you said. They go through the light. They see um, a deceased family member, a loved one. 
mm-hmm. who tells mm-hmm. them it's okay, everything is fine, you know, right. uh, don't worry. And then they proceed to go into heaven and usually they're told, well, well, if they're not, if they come back, it's not your time yet. And they're, right. they come back, but they have this beautiful and loving experience. But that by the mm-hmm. same token, you can find um, hundreds of people on YouTube talking about the near-death experience in the exact opposite way where they've went to hell and they suffered and they were burned and it was horrible. And uh, fortunately, they came back, but they see people down there suffering. What What is your take on that? Why is it that some people have that heavenly experience and some people have the hellish experience for their near-death experience? Why is that? Well, we, we've got the really interesting discussions about near-death experience. I've got a few chapters about them as well. Um, so we've got the first type, like you say. This is about 85% of the experiences, right? It includes things like white, a white light, a tunnel, sometimes a stairway, dead loved one. A life review is very important. Uh, the, li- and we can t- the life review is, is one of the biggest tricks that's used against you, actually. And uh, it's, it's something we should talk about. Um, and then... And then these beings are usually saying things. It's not your time. You have to go back. You've got more. You you have a mission to complete. No one's ever told what their mission is. Just oh, you have a mission to complete, right? You're never actually told what it is. Like if I was a soldier and was like, hey, you know, we've got to take that hill over there. You got you got the mission to do it. It's really important. Great. What do you need me to do? I'm not telling you. You know, that's kind of what it's like. So we we've got this experience and. What makes it even more difficult is the people who have those near-death experiences, and you know they're one hundred percent genuine. They tend to come back to planet, or I want to say planet, they come back to Earth, and they become better people. They transform, they change, they're more loving, they're kinder. They're actually they 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 become the kind of person you want to get to know. So everything about the experience should indicate this is great. How can you have anything negative to say about it? The challenge I've got is if this is a trap. And if going to the white light is the key element, as, as a number of people have said over the years, is the key element of starting the rein, starting your reincarnation cycle back here, then you would want to have a good propaganda campaign of getting people to think that's a really good thing to do, sending them back, and in fact, fixing that person's life so that people can say, I want a life just like them. I wish I could have their life. Then we've got these other ones. So yes, some some go further and they actually experience like they experience heavenly cities and experiences they go through like learning. Yeah. Then we've got these ones that have gone through hellish experiences, really, really difficult experiences. Um, I would be curious to ask them to see how much, for example, guilt and shame or regret did they take, were they taking with them after death to help? Because I don't know enough specifically about the people who've had those kind of experiences. Uh, was it in sense, was it in a sense triggered by uh, something in their own, in their own being that was, that was generating it or not? Then we've got the other ones who you can't really say it's hellish, but they're, they were terrified and they were realizing that they were being manipulated and most importantly, the ones that are very similar to um, the Star Trek Voyager episode Coda. And at the end of that, or the entire episode, the commander is is partway between alive and dead, and an alien is pretending to be her father, trying to get her to go into the white light. And there's this constant back and forth of trying to convince her to come in the white light. And she finally says, oh, I have to agree to do it. You can't force me to go into it. And it's like one of the, there's so many reveals in this episode, but that's a huge one. And all of these ones who are on this other side of it that are not having the standard experience, they've all talked about this, that something is trying to to get them to agree to whatever it is the beings want them to do. And and they, they need to, and if they didn't agree to it, it couldn't happen. So there's always this, and we talk about contracts that seem to be presented to, to souls before we even come here, that a number of the things we experience are contracted in, that we don't even realize we said, yes, we're, go- we're going to have this happen to us, so allow it to happen. And, you know, one of these things is to, is to really dig into this, is any of this true? I mean, we like to think we have all this free will and we're making choices all the time. But as soon as you say, well, this was destined to happen, or I was supposed to meet this person, or, well, that's not free will. So how much of our world is free will and how much of it is is pre-planned and who does the pre-planning? And then that takes you to the movie, The Adjustment Bureau, and off we go on a giant tangent, right? 
Yeah, I've got 50 questions. Let me go. While you mentioned free will, do you believe quickly that we have free will or do you believe that it's a deterministic reality? Um, it, it's a bit of both. I, I now believe that um, like any like any computer, if you're making computer simulation, you can't have a billion options. You just that, That's just too much computing power. It makes more sense to have a limited number of options um, that can be slightly changed and altered. And um, it makes sense to have things that will loop, things that will occur over and over again. So this is a perfect example for the study, not just of your own life, that's what the one of the things the recapitulation is so good for reviewing your life to see how many things are just a loop of something else. You're just repeating over and over and over again. But history itself, history itself is just a giant repeating cycle. And that would make sense if, if it's a computer type realm, because you would want to have you'd want to limit your 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 um, your uh, hard drive um, mechanism. Right. So I get the sense that we may have like, let's say we have like a thousand choices right now. It seems like free will. It's, we've got a thousand possibilities, but you and I cannot be the starting quarterback for Ohio State this Saturday. Like it doesn't matter what we do, no matter what kind of affirmations we make, no matter what, you know, we're not starting in, in the game on Saturday, you know? So we've got, there's obviously limits to what we think of as total free will. The question is just how limited is it? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? And I get the sense it's a bit smaller than we think the way we're set up now. The way we're set up now is we have got so many grooves and we're actually being monitored by certain beings and even parasitic entities, things that are tapping into us that are pushing us onto certain record grooves. And we can, though, say, for example, I think that's one of the things that the books of what Carlos Castaneda was trying to get to was this idea that if you, you can break all of these things, you can break all the contracts, all the agreements, all the things that are pushing you in certain directions and literally break that whole system, then you would have free will. So that's why it's a tough answer. I think theoretically, yes. How many are actually truly in that space right now? Probably very, very few, even though it looks like we're not. There's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a famous quote which says, the efforts which we make to escape from our destiny only serve to lead us into it, which makes me, which, you know, I've asked, uh, do you know who Neil Donald Walsh is? He wrote yep. the Conversations sure. with God trilogy. Sure. I asked him the same question about fate and determinism, or I should say free will and determinism. And mm. he said it's a little bit of both as well. He said, yeah. overall, when you look at the big picture, it's deterministic. But on a minute-to-minute -minute level, we do have um, a degree of free will. But like you said, we don't have unlimited options. You know, as much as I and want. And does it really? Yeah, and does it make a difference whether I have cereal or eggs for breakfast? Like on potentially all the important things in our life, the way it's structured now, we may be making no choice at all. Like I've I, I've done a full life recapitulation. I did one back in 2003. It took me four and a half years. I've done a second one since then. So I've reviewed every moment of my life. And once you start reviewing your life and begin pulling out events that you didn't even remember happened to you, and so you begin to get the entire structure of your life being completely different than you ever thought. And you begin to start to see how many times, I call it manipulated, that like the system just set something up to make us go a particular direction. Now, we like to use the term coincidence and we like to make it synchronicity. We like to think, again, it's all for our benefit. Someone cares about us and they, they need us to go left here because that's going to make the world a better place. Sometimes good things happen by that, but a, a lot of other times I've seen in my life exactly why I made a particular choice and I could see I was, ma I was manipulated into that choice externally and that didn't help me or, or anyone around me. So we, we, again, I'm not trying to give an answer here. I'm trying to get people to step back finally and just say, wait a minute, maybe I don't really know what's going on here. How can I test reality? How can I test myself to start knowing what is going on and sort of keep the ideas uh, at bay for a while and just openly check it out and come to your own conclusions. I don't want anyone to, you know, have to think what I think or think what anyone else thinks. It should be, it should be what you think, but you should really be testing all the things you believe 
are these things that are truly from your own experience or did somebody else outside of you tell you what to believe and then you just started ag agreeing to it and reality started agreeing to your agreement you know what i mean it, it's like who who chose our beliefs and why not why not make sure we choose all of them ourselves yeah i mean that's what i do i choose them myself because i realize that what i've learned in the mainstream is largely hogwash and so I have my own beliefs about things and I share some of them on this channel. Uh, again, I have many questions I can ask you. What did you say you did a life what? A life in... Um, yeah, it's in, in the Castaneda world, it's called a recapitulation or a, a, you can call it a life review, but it is done, done completely. It's reviewing every moment of your life, every second of Could it. Could you just elaborate completely. briefly on how you did that? Yeah, what I did was... Uh, um, I, I first read it in the Castaneda books and it sounded interesting. And I talked to some medicine men about it and the, the ones I went to the sweat lodges with on the reserve. And they said, good idea. Go ahead. Uh, I had no idea what to expect, but I tried to, I, I sort of put it together myself. I started by making a list of everybody I'd ever known, like ever met. And that took four or five months to make the list. Then I took the list and put down as many experiences as I could remember with those people. And then I sat down, in my case, I sat down in my closet most of the time. And because I wanted to, you want a space that's a bit enclosed, that sort of pushes your energy into you. And then it's just simply remember all the experiences as deeply as you can, not from your mind. You'll remember them first from your mind, but eventually you'll start feeling them. And at another point in time, you'll start to see the experience through your own eyes again you'll be in the experience you'll especially really important ones you'll be you'll be there again and you'll be seeing that what really happened is not anything like you re you have always remembered or thought about yourself you 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 see things finally truthfully and clearly you <clears throat> you lose that thing that's hiding things from yourself in the midst of it you are regaining energy you're you're releasing all the energy that you took from other people you're getting back the energy you gave to yourself so it's, it's tremendously healing it's tremendously strengthening and over time and i didn't and it was very boring i have to admit it was very dull to do even though i learned some stuff it was very dull it wasn't until i was done and i write about it in a chapter in falling for truth uh my second book uh i had an experience that revealed like a life-changing moment that i forgot and it's like how could i have forgotten this uh, and, and, and literally, I relived it. And now I've come to see over the years that's even more important than that, because it's preparing us for the life review we're going to get after we die. It's one of the key elements that we, we, we are going to get is, and particularly the beings like to focus on uh, all the things we did wrong, all the mistakes we made. And it doesn't matter. You could be the most wonderful Buddhist bodhisattva in the world. They're going to find the day that somebody dropped an apple and you didn't pick it up and they're going to chastise you for it. And this person then didn't, uh, they got upset about the apple and they went home and they killed their mother and it's all your fault. And they're going to try whatever they can to throw guilt and shame at you. So I now see the life review is so important as preparation because then we know our lives so intimately, there's nothing that they can throw at us that's going to be any kind of surprise. And even if it's something, an event of our life that wasn't so great, we can say, yeah, I, I went through that. I, I looked at it. I understand what happened. I, I transformed from it. I changed from it. I, I built a brand new life from it. And next. Because if I, I've now seen from these life, from the near death experiences I've studied, I've looked into a lot of them. If you want to go to for, uh, forever conscious research, boy, they do a ton of. He, Mark does it goes. He breaks them down really well there. But I've looked into so many of these on so many different channels, and um, they. It seems like the life review is really about guilt, shame, and regret. And if we carry those three emotions with us into the afterlife almost guaranteed they're gonna we're gonna get recycled back or they'll be you need to go back and learn love you need to go back and learn to be a kinder person you need to go back and see what it's like to experience this okay i guess i do i'm just not a good person as opposed to i'm the totality i'm i'm actually the completeness of everything you know i am the totality and the mistakes that happen in my life we have to we have to accept them we have to take responsibility for them and we have to find how did we transform ourselves from them, not lock ourselves into them. And, and you know, because that's that's one of the key things that will recycle us back in here, at least in my opinion. Do you ever envision or do you think 
that when your physical body expires, in other words, you die and you go through that process of, of going to the transition reality, going to the light, the things you said, do you think you will retain conscious memory and say to yourself, this is a trap. Don't go, don't go for it. Like, is there a way that we can circumvent that? Do you think we'll consciously know you'll consciously re be remembering this as you get there? I hope so. I, I, I've, I've had one near death experience, even though that in that experience, I didn't actually leave the body. I was in the body during the experience, but that was that, that showed me the non, the non reality of the self uh, is what that experience showed me actually. Um, there's there's a, a lot of things I think we can do to prepare ourselves because we're going to be in a non physical form when we die. That's we could, we all know that for sure. The body will be gone. We'll be in a non physical form. So two things can probably be helpful. One is learning lucid dreaming or out of body experiences. So we get used to being in a conscious state or having consciousness but not a body. So we're we're not confused. If you don't have a lot of preparation in that, I think that that's what happens to a lot of the recently deceased. They're so confused, then you get hit with this overwhelming love and it's almost like a drug then. You're confused, this massive love comes over you and you feel so comfortable, so happy, so peaceful. You'll kind of just do anything to keep the peace going. Oh, if you just go into the tunnel, you'll keep the peace going. Great, you know, as opposed to being able, like you say, to stay conscious and make decisions, which I think is the most important part of it. Just like here, can we step back and say, wait a minute, what's going on? Why should I do this? Why shouldn't I do this? Another researcher, his name was William Bullman. He wrote Adventures in the Afterlife. And he had one of his last chapters being a, something called uh, Setting Your Death Action Plan, which was if you have the ability, to, if you know you're in a, in a point of dying and you've got, you're in a hospital or hospice or you're at home and you've got three or days, four days before that, your actual death, what do you want that to be? How do you want to build your last days? It's like, it's your great opportunity. So what music do you want playing? What people do you want coming around? And for him, it was what words of encouragement do you want said to you? Because I guess hearing is the last of the senses to go, right, before we leave the physical form. Yeah. So for me, it would be things like that. It'd be, yeah, remember your remember your totality, remember your power, your focus is to go home, um, um, make, stay conscious. Uh, you know, I, I might, I, if I have something, I might want those things said to me over and over again. So I think various things like this, from the, doing the recapitulation, preparing in some out-of-body experiences, uh, getting yourself ready for how you want the transition to happen. I think these are all things that will make us at least be less confused. And then if you get into that state and your decision is, actually, I really want to come back to earth. I want to be in a body again. I want to be in then great. That's you know you've made that a hundred percent consciously, and you can't think later. I got I got deceived and manipulated into that. I think that's one of the most important things, at least, is we feel that when we're in that place, we're going to make the choice that we really want to make. Yeah, you say that. It also seems that whatever body we get from reincarnation is random. Uh, the body chosen is not really indicative of how we lived previously nor is it tied to any moral judgments based upon us. So it's, it's a very random yeah. thing. Maybe in one life, yeah. you're not attractive whatsoever. In another life, you could be a movie star or have movie star looks. Yeah. So it's, it's all just, you know, the cards that you're dealt. Because that's sort of, that's one thing that really bothers me sometimes when I would, would look at some of the certain uh, teachings of this like somebody has somebody comes in and they've got like some sort of physical deformity well that was because in your last life you must have been a bad person what what are you talking about if this was really a loving place it would be like let's you know if you were really bad let's give you a better opportunity to show what you can really do you know like and and to, to try to, to it's one of those things that used to also bother me about um uh, the affirmation game, you know, where they would just say, if you just, if you just do it, your affirmations enough, you'll make things come true. And if it didn't work for you, the problem is you, you, you made the mistake. You're not good enough or, or, or you, you yourself are not, you haven't perfected yourself. You don't have enough faith. It can't possibly be with the system. It can't possibly be with the whole idea that the problem is you. And these are some of the things that have really bothered me about some of this stuff, as opposed to realizing the problem's not you. And you actually don't have to fix anything.
There are some things that can be transformed, that are, but they're more, most importantly, it's just things you need to see through. You don't even need to learn anything. This is one of the most important, amazing things about this trip. You don't need to learn anything. Actually, you need to unlearn all the garbage you've been taught and just get back to a clean slate again and realize you have actually already know what you need to know. It's all this other junk that's hiding you from it. You've already got what you need. Drop all the other stuff that's false and you, you've got the truth just sitting right in front of you. So do, do you believe that we are punished for bad behavior in our next life or we're rewarded or there's absolutely no connection with that? I think we, we would punish ourselves. If, the, if, 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 if anything happens, we punish ourselves. Either we are told we've been bad and so it, it would be in your best interest to make your next life worse so you can learn from it. Oh, good idea. And so we create, we ourselves decide, yeah, more suffering, good idea. On the other hand, we might, we, one of the, if someone says, I'm done with suffering, like I'm not coming back for any, for any reason. Yeah, but remember this thing you really wanted to do or you really wanted to marry this person. Isn't that who you really, yeah, I really loved her. It's too bad. Well, how about in the next life we set it up that you can have that? Well, really? I can, I can do this and I can be rich and important. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I'll go back. So again, I think any level of deception is possible. And in some level, we're always agreeing to it as opposed to, Hey, this place is insane. And more people in the last three years have started to recognize everything about this place is nuts. The setup on no matter where you look here, it's just not the way a sane creator would set it up. And I think more and more people are getting the point of like, okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm just, I'm not coming back here. It doesn't matter what it is. You can't, you can't offer me enough to come back. I'd rather just sit in the void and fit, which is, I think that's what Dzogchen Buddhism is all about, right? Dzogchen Buddhism is all about practicing what they call the clear light, which is basically the light of the void. The idea being, if you get so comfortable with the void here, after you die, your natural inclination will be just go to the void. You'll avoid all this other stuff and you'll just, you'll avoid. You'll avoid by going to the void. And I think that that would give you a, people a chance to just make some decisions. Like kind of, okay, I'm not going to get deceived necessarily here immediately. And I'm going to just, what's going on? What's happening? How is it? How am I dealing with things? And to me, if, if that's a choice you can make, that sounds like a good one as a starting point. At least again, you're back to trying to be clear to know what is it you really want. And uh, that, that's a big one, right? It's just what, uh, so, so many people I know have asked people this direct question and they don't really know, what do you really want? And so they, they, they'll, they'll answer something, but, but really, is that what you really want? Well, no, I guess not. Well, what do you really want? I don't know. So that should be the first step is just, what is it you really want? What you, once you know what you really want, you know where to put your energy. If you don't know what you want, your energy is just going to scatter. Even if they're really positive ideas you have, you're never going to get much done because your energy scattered on a whole bunch of things you don't want. Yeah, some people are going to be very resolved in that, you know, look, I I know that the, the, the whole heaven thing is true and we go to the afterlife and we see our loved ones and that's fine, you know, and then there are going to be people like me who are open to your idea and then there are going to be people who actually embrace your idea because there are people that say it's a soul trap. So you got, you know, I'm in the middle, you have other people here and there, but I think it's great because, you know, there's going to be at least several thousand people watching this video that'll be exposed to you. Many of them probably have never heard of you. And so how do you tell my audience again, where they can check you out? Yeah, if you're on if popping to YouTube, you can catch, I got like, I guess, 300 videos up there now. Howdy McCoskey Talks. Um, I guess Chad will probably put a link somewhere. Yeah. Uh, my my website, which I don't really have much on there other than information about all of my books and where you can get them and sample chapters, but you can go to uh, the terribly named Egyptian-wisdom-revealed.com or just, you know, Google search my name, it'll show up. And um, yeah, that's where you can get more information on what I've been writing and what I've been sharing and... Um, see if any of it resonates there's there's so many topics i discuss so it's also find the topic that interests you and you know track through that first like some people might be more interested in the ancient egypt stuff some might be more interested in in um, my sort of uh, um, i won't call it attack on spirituality but my sort of presentation of what happened after my near-death experience others might want to look at the expositions others might want to look at this see see what resonates to you and um, see if something is useful if it is that's great
Yeah, I'm going to go check out. You have a video about Matrix scripts. I want to see what that's about. That's on your YouTube channel. You got a lot mm. of interesting content there. So I recommend you check that out. And uh, I'll post, you know, the YouTube channel and website for Howdy below, just in case you don't get that whole website there. <laughs> uh, but yep. uh, again, thank you, Howdy, for being on. And I'm sure we'll have you on again. Thanks, I, I appreciate it. This was a really good time. I think we got a lot of good discussion and it'll be interesting to do it again. Absolutely. Cheers. You too.